Um, okay, we finished last time. We finished going through the basic review for the stuff that, for those of you that did not have 201, now y'all are kind of sort of up to speed. Remember, you makes a homework problem set that's only a half a dozen questions, maybe eight, I can't remember how many questions, but then it that longer complicated. Um, be sure to do that sometime before the test. Be sure not just that there's a print out, uh, a printable copy that you can just print and work it out on paper, but be sure to go back in and put in your answer so then, then you know whether you got the right answer or not, and B, you also end up getting credit for having done it by submitting the answers there. Um, so that's that. Uh, the test is in, what, like two weeks? Something like that? Does anybody know? Um, I know it's, it's early, but I just don't want things to sneak up on you all the way they sneak up on me. January 31st. Okay. That's coming up to today's what? 17th. Okay, so two weeks from today? 17 plus 13 is 30. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Two weeks from today, we will have a test and it will cover what. However much we get to it. So, we have any? So, uh, we're switching gears. This is new stuff for almost all of you, but maybe elasticity. When you see the word elasticity, what do you think of? A rubber band. Like a rubber band. Something stretchy. Okay, good. Um, if it's stretchy, there's another word that you want to use. Malleable. Ooh, good. He's got the vocabulary. Malleable, which is a big heavier word than what I was like flexible. All right. So that's what elasticity here. Ultimately, when the dust settles, we're talking about flexibility. Most of the what we're talking about is flexibility on the part of the customers, but it actually also shows up for the suppliers as well. But we're going to be looking at how flexible we are. Ultimately, we're going to be looking at how flexible the amount we buy. Is so how and then as things change and so the first so we're going to have three different measurements that we're going to look at and the first one being the price elasticity of demand so right now demand our willingness oh this could kill me not have a smart word okay. Um, uh, okay, my computer doesn't crash in the next few seconds. I think I'm gonna ask you. Demand is our willingness and ability to buy, right? And so I'm talking about how flexibility, how flexible is our willingness and ability to buy. And in this case, it is how flexible is our willingness and ability to buy based on them messing with the price. If they mess with the price, if they raise the price, is that going to change us buying something? Yeah. But is it going to change it a little or a lot? A lot. It depends on what the price is. It depends. It depends on what the price is, how big the price change is, and just exactly what the product is. Right. Uh, Netflix is changing their price. Their regular plan, is, the eleven dollar plan, is now going to be thirteen dollars. Their cheapest plan is going from like from what seven to nine. Um, so, how many dollars they run through Netflix? I'm not doing that. Oh, okay. So, how many of you are like, I don't care because I'm using somebody else's account as long as they keep paying it? Okay. I didn't see some hands going up. Shame on you. Uh, what was it? I heard somebody the other day. It's like, well, you know, I've got 11 people sharing a password. We all paid out. Now I got to find two more people to get in on the plan. Oh, we do. 
So how many of you, so some of you would say, you know, forget Netflix. Some of you would say, you know, for that, um, I love Netflix. They're high quality programming so much. I'm going to keep paying even though they want more money. If SunTrop raises their prices, I'm not going anywhere. If grandma's heart medication price goes up, she, you got to pay for it, right? But so some things, if the price changes, it is going to change our willingness and ability to buy. It's going to change the way we think about it. Where other things, well, it doesn't change our willingness and ability to buy, but it changes how much we buy. But other things, not so much. I love me some SunTrop. They'll have to seriously raise their price before the amount I buy changes. So that's where we're going here. I don't know what this is. Never seen that before. Okay. Uh, so, price elasticity of demand is a response of customers to a change in price. You can use response, responsiveness, flexibility, sensitivity. That's another good word to think of. Sensitivity. How sensitive are we to a price change? The response of customers to a change in price. Which, are you math people? It's just as simple. It is the percentage change in the amount we buy. The quantity demanded. So that's out of the textbook with the amount we buy. Sales, right? How much they sell is how much we buy, right? Percentage change in sales divided by the percentage change in price. Uh, so you do that math, and you end up going to end up getting a number, and that's going to let you know that. So you can start comparing. You know, customers are very sensitive to us changing the price of one thing, but they very they're really sensitive to us changing the price in another thing. So you can start comparing and contrasting, and that's a beautiful thing about your senses, and you can compare things. The math ain't that hard. We're going to work with you with these before we get done tonight. Are with me so far. So, uh, how many of you are like uh, percentage change what? Okay. The way to calculate percentage change is new minus old, take away old. You start with what's the new number, you subtract the old number, and you see how much change is, and then you divide it by the old number to get it into a form of a percent. Um, so in this case, we would be talking new price minus old price divided by old price, new sales minus old sales divided by old sales, which is anything in math, it was never parentheses. Or the way I actually do it is I do new minus old and I hit the equal button because I like to look at the results. I like to see that little answer before I get the division problem. So, um, Josie, all right. Josie, um, her IQ was 122. But Josie started doing illegal drugs because we have recently found out that Josie is a starter. So Josie ended up doing, she, she got caught up in doing drugs, and now her IQ is 80. Average is 100, just so you know. So what ended up happening? Her IQ went from 122 down to 180. Her IQ dropped by 42 points. I like to look at that number. But then divided by what was her IQ to begin with? 122. Her IQ dropped by right at a third. And I'm going to call it. Uh, I'm going to call that about 34. 0.34 or 34.4%. That's my conceit with 34 or 35. I don't know. Did you just calculate on the right hand? So, you see how to do things? Where is she now? I mean, excuse me. Where is she now? Take away where was she? And the nice thing is if you do the new minus, if you do old minus new, yeah, you're still going to get the same number on top. But if you do new minus old, this negative is telling you her IQ did what? Negative. Her IQ went down. No, within the, I mean, no, I'm like, if you stick with, I mean, I said you could do it backwards, you still would get the number 42, but by making sure you do new minus old, then you know this sign here will be meaningful to you. It tells you not only did her IQ change by 42 points, but it 
went down by 42 points. 34.4. And so, but you got to make sure that you have that old number at the bottom. But for those of you that just, if you could use the percentage button, I mean, no, not the percentage, but the, 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 the parentheses on your calculator, that's fine. But if you just have a little $3 calculator that you stole from the dollar store or something like that, that's fine. Just new minus old equals divided by old. Do it that way. If you just sort of don't remember your order of operations nightmare, right? Uh, if you are doing it in Excel or whatever, you don't have the parentheses, right? You do 88 minus 122 divided by 122. It's going to go 122 divided by 122 is 1. 80 take away 1 is 79. And you think her IQ went up by 79 points for her equal life of drugs. You go wrong. Well, it depends on the drug she's taking, I guess. So, the math. The numbers are going to be friendlier than these numbers that I just gave you on the test. It will be friendlier than the numbers I just gave you on the homework. And they could be 34.4. It's going to be 20%, 25%, 30%, 35%, something like maybe 33 because that's a third, right? We're used to dealing with that number. Uh, since I'm a carpenter, actually I go into sixteenths sometimes just because I I'm, those are normal numbers that I need six and a quarter, twelve and a half, uh, whatever that is, uh, eighteen and three quarters, twenty-four, right, just to seventeen or yeah, whatever those numbers are. Uh, so don't be don't. But if you end up with a number, it, when you're doing homework, you end up with a number. When you're doing the test, you end up with 0 0.893217. You do something wrong. I'm just telling you now. Uh, I want you to just sort of understand the process. I don't want to, you to get lost in the math. But I want you to do a little bit of calculations to help you with the process. So, um, give me a product. Make up something. Toy. More specific. What toy? What are you? Too good. Toy Story 4 movie coming out to theater near you soon. So they're releasing a new Woody that, like, his fingers will move so he can flip you off. I don't know. So, flip you off, Woody. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> I don't know that everyone would do this. Okay. Um, I can't even film. <laughs> Woody. I just, I'm just so afraid that some of y'all are going to get you my instant cutter and I'm going to get it over. So, um, no, let's do something a little bit more common than that because they were selling them last year. Uh, what? Soft. Softballs? No. Because <laughs> I think it's ball. Soccer ball. Okay. Okay. Let's see. So we are whatever. I can't even think of the name of the companies that make soccer balls that everybody uses anymore. Anyway, so we're selling soccer balls. Meat trade. Huh? Me tray. Yes, them. I didn't know that that's how they pronounced it, to be honest with you, so that's why it took me to. Okay. Oh, so last year they sold 18 million soccer balls. This year they sold. Oh, excuse me. Yep. Last year they sold 18 million. This year they sold. 21 million. Woohoo! Last year, the price of soccer balls was $30 a piece. This year, the price is $27 a piece. So, what happened here? They lowered the price, they sold more. Right? Woohoo! So, to do this, so, so, does somebody have these numbers? Remember them? 18, 21, 13, 13. Somebody have them? Fine. Yeah. Yeah. So, we're so, we compute the percentage change in sales. So, the new, how many are they selling now? 21. They're now selling 21, where they used to sell 18. So, new minus old 18. So, what are they doing? They sold 3 million more soccer balls this year than they did last year. 
divided by the 18, that's not an even number, is it? Uh, no, yeah, that, no. 16 or so. Yes, okay. 16.6. 16 percent, okay. Sorry. So that's how much your sales, so what happened? Their sales went up 16%. So, why did that happen? Because their price is now $27, where it used to be $30, right? So their price went down by three bucks. Compared to the $30 that they used to charge for these things, their price went down 10%. So they lowered their price 10%, and their sales went up by 16%. Now we've got to, we've got the ball on a five yard line, time to punch it in. To compute this elasticity number, we have to do 0.166 divided by 0.1, and you get 1.6. Negative 1.6. Why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> Does this number make sense to you? Does this number make sense to you? Does this number have any meaning to you? No. Not yet, no. It doesn't yet. This is just a, a percentage divided by percentage is one. Okay. Um, this number has no, this 1.6, negative 1.6 has no meaning in reality other than for economics and economics. But it's always, it should be a negative number every time. Because what should happen, when you raise your price, you can sell less. When you lower your price, you're going to sell more. But this number actually is telling you, every 1% you raise your price, you can lose 1.6% of your sales. Every 1% you lower your price, you're going to gain 1.6% of the sales. So if you're sitting there, you're the manager, you're sitting in the office, or what happens if we raise our price by 2 2%? Well, you can figure it out that we're going to lose 3.6% of our sales. What happens if we raise our price by 20%? We're going to lose 32% of our sales. Right? So that's what this number is telling us. With me? Okay. Now, uh, let me go forward. Okay. I purposely. So I might remember that 1.6 number because I'm going to come back to it. Uh, there's a couple things we need to think about when we're thinking about. Yes, I did a fantastic job erasing your good one. Okay. As I just said, technically, it's going to be a negative number all the time. Almost all the time. There are some things out there that if they raise their price, we're going to buy more of it. There are some things out there that when they lower the price, maybe we're going to buy less of it, but just, but that ain't normal behavior. That's middle school kids wearing tennis shoes behavior. You know, the higher the price goes, the more they're interested in the shoes, right? But most all the time, it's going to be a negative number. We're assuming rational behavior, so we're ignoring middle school kids. But you get a negative number. So on the test, if you mess up, when you come up with the final answer or whatever, stick a negative on it. When you do a price less, does it mean right? If you lose it along the way, get it in there when you get to the end. Right. So that elasticity number, if that number is ignore the negative for now. If that number is bigger than one, that means our demand is elastic. You get a big change in sales compared to a relatively small change in price. And that's what we just saw with that 1.6, right? They changed it by 10% and they lost one to 16% of their sales. One out of every six customers went away just because of a 10% pay rate. Or price increase. So ignoring that negative. If the number you have is greater than one, your demand is what we call elastic. Your sales are going to really change from a small price change. 
If the elasticity is less than one, the demand is inelastic. Yeah, you might lose your sales by raising your price, but you don't lose anywhere near the sales that you do compared to the price change. A big price change still may only cause a small change in sales. And for you mathematical completists, you can technically get it to where you have an elasticity exactly equal to one, which means for every 1% you raise your price, your sales goes down by 1%, nothing really changes. We call that unit elastic, and the only way you'll see that in this classroom is by making a mistake, making up numbers off the top of my head. So you're with me? It's okay. So, give me another product. Might be that way then. Uh, let's see. Last year, whatever it is, they sold 40 million. This year, they sold um, okay, 44 million. Uh, last year, the price. No, I'm just being completely this. 36 million. Uh, last year the price was. If the, this year the price went up to. Six million. Okay, they raised the price from $50 to $60. But what ended up happening? They sold less. That makes sense. You want me to give y'all a minute to do this problem before I do the problem? Crooks, if I agree, you're like, we got three of you that have paper. Some of you are like, what are you trying to Percentage change in sales divided by the percentage change in price. Is that 60? Yes. That's 60, that's a 15. Remember you percentage change in sales first. New minus old. Sales is now what? 36. 36, where it used to be 40. 40. The sales went down by 4 million. Compared to the 40 that they were, sales went down 10%. Leave it as a decimal. Don't do that extra step because I don't got. I don't know if you like me, I don't understand that percentage, but my calculator, leave it as a decimal, leave them both as a decimal. So, price, the price is now 60, where it used to be 50. They raised their price by $10. Compared to the 50 they used to charge, their price went up by 20%. So they raised their price by 20%, they only lost 10% of their sales. So when you calculate that out, negative 0.1 divided by 0.2 gives you negative 0.5. So every 1% that they raise their price, they only lose a half a percent of sales. If they double their price, their sales can only be cut in half. Score. What do you think if this is you? You, your company. The demand here is inelastic. Your customers don't have flexibility. They don't have options. They're stuck buying what you're selling. Even though you're raising the price, you're not scaring very many of them away. So they're kind of trapped. So what can you do? Raise the price. Raise the price. Take advantage of it. 
Yes, keep jacking the price up and okay, maybe we won't sell as much. So we won't sell as much, we ain't gotta work as hard. But with a higher price, we'll be making more money. Score, more money for less work. How many of you are on board with that? Having inelastic demand is a fantastic place to be as a company, as a producer. The company used to make like some of these medications. Like I said, grandma, she can't just say, well, they raised the price of my heart medication and I just won't pay for the next. <laughs> Right. She can't really do that. She's got to keep buying it. That's that, that part of the thing with the EpiPens a couple of years ago. The price just skyrocketed. The people like, I gotta have insulin. Bizarrely enough, I just get, apparently it's just getting insanely expensive to get insulin now, but you gotta buy it. Right. Just a few years ago, uh, it was like $30 a pop. Now it's like 170 But guess what? Diabetic people, they gotta have it. So, in this case, ignoring the negative, the number is less than one. So the demand is inelastic. So your customers aren't really that flexible, they don't really have options, so you're not gonna scare them away if you raise your price, so you can raise your price. This is me when it comes to sun drop. They can raise their price an interesting amount before I start slowing down the amount of sun drop I turn. I don't even want to think about that. <coughs> I would weep. I would cry. I you you just ball. buy a larger Except ball. Except my sun drop, yes. You but just buy a larger ball. Well, yeah, I, I, I'd scoop it, scoop it out into two liter bottles, using Yeti cups, that kind of stuff, so you know, get lighter quicker and that kind of thing. Flats, because I'd be glass bottles. Oh, glass bottles, yes. And then, or I might just like have to do the five finger discount when I go in the store or just start stuffing them in my pockets or you know, the four finger discount if I was a Simpsons character. Got a, a lot of you cartoon characters only have four fingers because it's just actually unreal when you look at some a cartoon a hand as strong as five fingers, it looks like there's one too many, so they just psychologically need to generally most of the time eliminate a finger. Just so you know. Is there gonna be on the test? Okay. Could yeah. be. Oh, thank you. Thanks for credit. How many figures does Homer Simpson have on each hand? Yeah. Uh, we won't talk about those, though. So. Okay. I'm honestly having a flashback. Didn't Homer lose a toe at some point? Or am I getting him confused? I think I'm getting him confused. I'm, I'm sorry, y'all. The Simpsons have not been good since y'all have been born. But after about season three, season three to about nine or ten, it was awesome. But then they jumped a the shark. It's just, it's just different. Just like South Park, first season of South Park was just awesome. And then they just, they went too far and it stopped being funny. And they just sort of like, okay, I mean, they did that. And it's a little bit of an implode sense that I've given up on. South Park is more or less just shocking. Yes. Yes, and actually being funny. Yes, but they no, they have, they have as a season one, and then the first twenty minutes of the movie. That's funny. Do not watch the movie. I cannot condone anybody watching a movie for the first twenty minutes. Let's see if I already watched. I like to cry. Anyway. Anyway. I'm thinking about that. They're bouncing back and forth between that and the my favorite sense of episode, but anyway. Anyway. Are you with me on how, how to do math? You want to do another one? You don't have to because we're gonna do some other problems that are very, very, very similar. But so are you close on doing the math? We'd be close then, okay. So, visually speaking, if you were to graph these domain curves, a domain curve for an elastic product like, what was it, soccer balls, the domain curves could be fairly flat. A small change in price here is going to lead to a big change in sales, right? That is your elastic demand. Inelastic demand. It's going to look more like this, where you know, even a decent sized change in price, what happens to the sales? Not a whole lot. 
if you met with medical people, Union Elastic is a perfect 45 degree line there. But don't worry about it. Just if you accidentally get there sometime in the legs, man, congratulations. Um, so, Um, in reality, domain curve or product, you think about the way. No, I think I did a screenshot. But, oh, no. Okay, yeah, I did move my Okay, I'm aware of that. Okay, so we got to go to the red line here. In reality, a domain curve for product. Is shaped like this. So guess what? For the same product, if sometime in its life, in its life, it might be elastic. But at some time in its life, for the same product, it might be inelastic. If the price gets cheap enough, a bunch of people are going to come on board. But if the price gets expensive enough, only the hardcore people are going to stick around, and you're going to lose a lot. So it just sort of depends, and usually you, the big company is going to operate in a range. Most companies could be somewhere in the middle here. You know, there's not too many of them. Apple is trying to play up here with their iPhones. They're like, well, we can raise our prices because we've got people so, like, hypnotized into buying all and drinking the Kool-Aid that Apple and the South don't think it will work for them. And so Apple is trying to play up here and then they go from raising their phone prices from 600, 700, 800, 900 to 1,000. And yeah, they've lost some sales, but they've gone from like $700 to $1,000 their sales are only down maybe 10%. Apple is trying to play up here where, you know, there's other companies that, you know, they may end up operating down here you know, if they're making stuff other people are making, but if they're making things like a cheap Android phone, how many of those can you get? There's a bunch, one, a bunch of them out there. So the only way to make a splash on you, Motorola selling the cheap Android phone versus y'all going out and buying the LG one or going out and buying the Nokia one is? As long as the chips weren't made by Huawei, yeah. Yeah, as long as chips are Huawei, yeah. Um, the, so what ends up happening is we're down here, we're competing on price, then we lower our price, and we're going to end up stealing a bunch of customers from everybody else because all the phones are about the same down here. But a lot of companies are going to be trying to operate somewhere in the middle. They would love to operate up there in the, in the last three origin. That's just for the fun of it for you visual learners. There are extremes. I'm going to draw them and then we'll talk about them. You could have somebody, and my 201 students might remember this person. You could have a product where the demand is perfectly straight up and down, mathematically. But what happens? What's happening there? They're going to buy the same amount. If the price is a dollar, if the price is five dollars, they're still buying the exact same amount. So that is somebody who's making a purchase who money makes absolutely positively no difference whatsoever in their buying decision. Who would that be? Okay. Yeah, uh, so billionaires. But billionaires, and they're going to be the sole people demanding this product. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you're only selling to billionaires, the demand for your product is only so like it's luxury yachts or something like yeah, that. That's but, exactly so what I'm only billionaires, but but they're still cheap enough that the billionaires aren't going to balk you the price. Um, so the other thing is what a yacht is to a billionaire, a piece of penny bubble gum is to us. How many of us are going to say, "Ooh, penny bubble gum went up to two cents a piece"? Screw it, right? So maybe the demand for penny bubble gum might be pretty straight up and down. What is that? We buy it a week before Halloween, or we buy it helps five o'clock Halloween afternoon because we're like, oh crap, we forgot to get candy to give out, and that's all that's left, and better to give that stuff out than give your house dead. Right. You know, people are. But so mathematically you can see this, but in reality, it doesn't really make sense. The only other thing that might have a demand like this, Josie. 
is her crack, her heroin, her meth, whatever it is. She's got to have what she's got to have, and she's going to pay whatever she's got to pay, whatever it's selling for on that particular given day, right? So those products, once they get you hooked, yeah. So your illegal drugs might have a demand that's fair, pretty steep when it comes to the any elasticity. But in either case, that ain't normal. A drug addict's behavior isn't normal rational behavior. Because rational behavior is you're raising the price, I'm gonna buy less. Drug addict isn't making that, isn't thinking that way. They're like, well crap, that means I gotta go beat up a couple old ladies to steal their money instead of just one. All right. Josie, you know who you are. Um, so, uh, billionaires, that ain't normal, right? Billionaires aren't normal, drug addicts aren't normal. So that straight up and down, perfectly vertical line, mathematically is possible, but you really not, I mean, it ain't normal. And for most normal products, it's not gonna get there. Mathematically, you could get a demand that looks like this. What happens there? They're gonna buy it at that price and only that price. They're gonna buy it at that price and only that price. If it's three dollars, well, who knows what we're gonna sell? If it's three oh one and above, we know we're selling nothing. If it's two ninety nine and below, we know we're selling nothing. It's only that three dollar perfect price is the only time that we'll sell, and then who knows? We might sell one, we might sell a million. Does that make sense? No, no. no, mathematically, for you math majors, you could end up with a math problem that would come out that way, but it just ain't going to happen, right? In reality, it won't happen, but... What about extreme? Um, um, that, to that, that level of extreme? Extreme? No. Just, you really can't. How could somebody willingly buy something for $3 and turn around and nobody buy it at $2.99? Yes, uh, it doesn't follow extreme. logic. Oh, the extreme up and down, yes. the, the extreme horizontal, no, the extreme up and down, we talk about not normally, but it can happen. The illegal drugs, the selling products only to billionaires, and uh, maybe um, that's the, so very rare that you, you could have something where it's straight up and down vertical, but you ain't gonna get one that's horizontal. But just know for you math majors, if you're making up a product, you are you, uh, making up a homework problem to practice or something, you could accidentally stumble into one of those, but just, it ain't gonna happen. Yeah. The horizontal, the flat demand curve means perfectly elastic demand, any price change is gonna cause demand to go to zero, price increase or decrease, that's crazy cost. The vertical demand means that the quantity did not the amount we buy ain't going to change at all based on the price because people are not thinking about the price when they're thinking about buying. Josie's not thinking about the price when she's looking to get her next day ball pair when she's just got the jitters, right? And she's like, I need to go down, I need to go down, I need to go down, I need to go down. She ain't even thinking about money, right? Oh, so I think, right? Okay. So, what determines how flat or non flat the demand is? What determines how flexible you and I are as customers when making a decision are we going to buy it or not? Well, don't read this slide list. Before we get to the list, the first thing is that those things, the demand elasticity, the determinants of demand that we talked about in the last chapter. Taste of preferences, income, price of substitutes, price of complements, number of buyers, all of the expectations, all of those things are helping to determine the up and downward list of the slope. Because we would prefer to pay less than to pay more. The more of something we eat, the less enjoyment we're going to get out of it. So we'd be willing to, we're not as willing to pay as much. To drink the eighth beer that's going to make you throw up, how many are you willing to pay? How many of you are willing to pay money for something that's going to make you sick? I'll pay money because season might go up on the only eight beer. Okay, but what if it's only what if it's you that's going to be paying money for you to throw up? I don't throw up from eight beers. Good for you. Most, most people yell it to on me. Anyway, just yeah. anyway, I retired. Moving on. Oh, 
but so you have those determinants of demand, but then there's four extra things to tag on. So taste preferences, right? Income, expectations, price of substitutes, price of compliments, those things. Also, the question of do you have to have it? Or is it something you like to have? Is it a need versus a want? That changes your thinking. Some people need sun drops, some people only want it. Some people need coffee, some people only want it. So that changes the behavior between those two coffee drinkers. Do you, got, do you need coffee in the morning or do you just want it? I think I've got slides describing each of these coming up. Availability substitutes. What else is there out there? Josie is jonesing for her next kid and she's talking to the only drug dealer in the county. She has absolutely no choice, right? But if she's talking to a drug dealer and she knows that, well, you know, there's another drug dealer in the crack house three doors down, so she ain't got to buy or pay whatever this dude's charging, right? That gives her some flexibility there. The relative price, I a little bit ended at this one, how the price of the product relates to your income and how it relates to the price of other products. If you're talking about your cable bill or even your Netflix bill, that kind of matters. If you're talking about a piece of penny bubble gum, doesn't matter so much because that's so small compared to your paycheck, right? And then the fourth one is time. Can you delay the purchase? Can you postpone the purchase? When Josie is like having the jitters and the vibrating, start de having the detox, what? she can't not get that next hit. If you cut your arm off with a chainsaw, you can't go walking into the hospital carrying a bloody stump in your other hand and say, oh, how much do you charge to sew this back on? Ooh, well, let me get a car drive to another hospital and see what they'll do for it. Right. There's some purchases you cannot delay. So I've got slide. Yes, I thought I had slides for each of these. The necessity, is it something that you have to have versus you want to have? The more you have to have it, the less important price ends up being, the le or the less sensitive you are. Yeah, the less sensitive you are, the less your decision is being made on what's price. The, the, you know, the diabetics with the insulin. They have to have it. For y'all and M Ms, they like to have them. Do any, do any of you need M Ms? You can't function without a pack of M Ms a day. So M Ms, I'm going to do things. A little bit generous to call them a luxury item, but yeah, they kind of are. Well, we can postpone that. You can delay getting a new car and keep riding that piece of junk death trap that you're riding in another month or two and wait for things to get better. So the demand for luxury goods is going to be elastic, where the demand for necessities is inelastic because you have to have them. The electric company raises their price. You just flip the swipe light switch a little bit less, but you still buy any electricity. You can't go back to candles. You may, availability substitutes. This comes back to options. Again, how many options do you have? M&Ms are getting more expensive. Well, instead of M&Ms, oh, I'm okay eating the stickers. I'm okay eating the three musketeers. I'm okay eating Reese's Cups. No, I'm okay eating Reese's Pieces. No, I'm okay eating the Zero Bar. I'm okay eating Milky Way. I'm okay. What else are you? If you've got options, then you have options. Then you don't have to pay as much. You, you, they raise their price. You've got options. You can go elsewhere. Generally speaking, the more options you have, the better off financially you're going to be. As a customer, the less locked in you are on any product, the better off you are. If you are locked into the Apple ecosystem, well, then you can just go out there and find the best, cheapest phone, whatever, come up with the best deal that's out there, and hop from thing to thing. If I wasn't so locked in on Sundrop, well, then I would be, I could get Mountain Dew sometimes cheaper, drink my yellow soda cheaper. I could actually scoop the correct amount. No, I can't go to my yellow. But, right? So, you know, I, I could go Pepsi, Coke, Dr. Pepper, Mountain Dew, whatever's cheap. I, that would be what I would be drinking any particular week. But if I'm locked into SunDrop to see it and only SunDrop, then I've got to pay what they're going to pay. As a company, hiring people, the more options you have, the less you have to pay your workers, which saves you money. If you've got 100 people lined up outside your door saying, I want a job, well, then you can pick and choose. 
And people, you can say, offer a low starting salary. And if they don't like it, you can say, okay, we'll get out. I got 99 other people waiting outside the door. But if there's nobody else waiting outside the door, then you kind of have to pay what you got to pay for that one person that's there. So the more options you have, generally, in life, the better off you're going to be financially. Relative price, how is that price in relation to your income? The closer to your income it is, the more elastic the demand is. Your car payment, you know, that's really going to influence things. Your direct TV payment, that's going to influence things. A pack of gum, a candy bar, or something like that, not a big thing. And time, can you delay the purchase? If you can delay the purchase, you have an opportunity to find lower prices and get lower prices. But if you can't delay, you've got to pay whatever it is. You don't want to lose out in the hospital parking lot. So, higher prices don't always mean higher total revenue. Revenue means what? We have a word for that. A single word. No. Income. Income. The IRS is the Internal Revenue Service, and they're taxing our income, income tax. That's how you remember that. So, just because you raise your price doesn't mean you're going to make more money, because when you raise your price, you're going to sell less, right? So you're getting a little bit more money for each one you sell, but you aren't selling as much. So maybe when the dust settles, you might end up bringing home less money. But sometimes raising your price will bring you more money because, yeah, you raise your price, you're selling less, but not a whole lot less, so you might end up bringing home more money. Raising, sometimes raising your price is the way to get you more money. Sometimes lowering your price is the way to get you more money. And that's going to depend on the elasticity of the product. Um, if the elasticity is greater than one, I mean, excuse me, less than one, the elasticity is inelastic. Your customers don't have options, so they're going to kind of stick with you through thick and thin. Raising your price will bring you more money because you won't scare them away by raising your price. They'll scare away a few of them, but not a lot. So if your demand is inelastic, like Apple, or raise your price, Get more money out of it. You'll get more money. They sell 10% fewer phones, but they are selling for 30 or 40% higher price. They're bringing home more money. If the demand is, it is elastic, you end up with an elasticity number greater than one, like we did with soccer balls. Uh, raising your price even a little bit is going to scare away a lot of customers. You don't want to do that. But then flip side up, lowering your price a little bit will bring you in a whole bunch more customers. So maybe going from $20 to $19 may end up giving you, going from $20 million to $30 million sales. That sounds like a winner there. So if the demand is elastic, you lower your price. If the demand is inelastic, you raise your price. And if you're unit elastic, oops, you mathematical completeness, it doesn't matter. You raise your price by 1%, your sales go away 1%, nothing changed. You're selling 101 up for 99 cents, or you're selling 99 of them for 101 cents, you just make the same amount of money, right? So. For you visual people, here you go. If the demand is inelastic, a big price increase will lead to a small quantity, a small drop in sales, which is going to leave you with an increase in your income. Whereas if the demand is elastic, even a small price increase can lead to a big sales decrease, and that is going to lead to a reduction in your income. Think about it, working more hours at a lower paying job versus fewer hours at a high paying job. Well, it depends on just how many hours you're working, and it depends on just exactly what those wages are, or you're going to be better off or worse off. Okay, I already hinted at this. The price elasticity changes along the demand curve. Remember where I drew it? I showed you those. 
and then you'll ask the range and then you'll ask the range of the same one. You with me? Okay, so that was price elasticity of demand. How sensitive are our sales to change in price? Now we have income elasticity of demand. Anybody want to take a guess what this is? Yeah, it's the exact same. Price elasticity was how sensitive are our sales to a change in price. This is how sensitive are our sales to a change in our customers' incomes. If we give Josie more money, Leaving the price of our, what, what's your favorite drug choice? <laughs> meth, you say. Okay, if we leave the price of our meth the same, Josie gets more money, and she can buy more meth or less meth. More, how much more? A lot more. A little bit more or a lot more. Well, it depends on how much her pay, her pay increase was, and just how important in her life is meth. Right. So, what we see is, uh, I can't remember who was somebody said it just a minute ago, when we get more money, when our in incomes increase, we're going to buy more. Generally speaking, we're going to be buying more. Most of the time. Because what are y'all spending money on now? The things you're important. Because you only got much money now, right? Gas to get here. So what are you spending that money on? Important things. Like gas to get here, rent, cell phone bill, Car payment, you ain't blowing a whole bunch of money on stupid stuff, All right? But as you so, if you're spending money on important stuff or stuff you really, really like, well, what happens if you get more money? You can tend to spend more of it on those things that you're already spending it on, the things that are really important to you, the things that you really, really like. You really like M&Ms? Are you buying some with your little bit of money? Well, you get a little bit more money? Well, you can buy you more M&Ms that you really like. But Increasing incomes generally, it, overall, we're good about spending. If you somebody gives us extra money, we're going to spend it. So, the income elasticity is percentage change in sales divided by a percentage change in income this time. The exact same formula, except I replaced the word. Price for the word income. Otherwise, it's the exact same formula, the exact same math. You do it the exact same way. And you always start with sales. Sales is always going to be on top. So I'm going to show you now. When you see these problems on a test, turn off your brain and just start working. Just automatically do percentage change in sales. Do it first, then do percentage change in the other one, and then divide it. Then you turn your brain back on and start looking at what you did. But just blindly do percentage change in sales first, and then divide it by the percentage change in sales or whatever the other thing is. Sales, income, or cross price that we'll talk about here in a few minutes. Next Thursday. Next Thursday. So. What we have here is, let's see, last year we sold, last year we sold it in the term of right. Last year we sold 50, this year we sold 55. Last year the income in the, the average income of customers in our area um, we're a car dealership, okay? We're, we're, we're done to use cars. And so the last year, the average income of people in the greater Dundas metropolitan area the was, let's see, last year it was $30,000 a year. The average person brought home $30,000 a year. This year, the average person is bringing home $36,000 a year because some company came to town, using the word town right over recently, some company came to town and started, started hiring people. Okay. So incomes went up, and as a result, people bought more cars. Okay. What kind of dealership is it? Where it was a new car dealership. 
Well, just the oil layout with the stick with cars. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so this is what we see here. Incomes go up. We buy more. Somebody got these numbers. Remember. So, percentage change in sales. Sales are now 55, where it used to be 50. We are selling 5,000 more car, five cars, five more cars this year than we did last year. Compared to the 50 we sold last year, we did 10% more business this year than last year. And how did we, why did we do that? Well, last year, let's see, now everybody's making 36, the average income is $36,000 a year, or used to be 30,000. People are bringing home $6,000 a year more. Compared to the 30 that the people used to make, people's income went up by 20%. Ironically, and we're going to end up with the same numbers that we had on one of the other examples. That's what happens when I make up stuff on the top of my head. So our elasticity, 0.1 divided by 0 0.2 is 0.5. Make sure you do new minus old divided by old. Make sure you do that new minus old because in this case, positive number, positive number. We People made more money, they bought more cars. But it could have been the people lost money because of a government shutdown because it was a government facility that was in town and then, right? And so maybe they incomes went down, sales went down. You got to keep up with the positive and negative here. The price elasticity, you can just sort of, if you get a little bit sloppy with math, just stick the negative number in it when you negative sign when you get to the end. Here, you got to keep up with it because there are exceptions. There are some things that we talked about earlier. You raise, you know, people get more money, they're going to buy less of it. We'll get to that in a few minutes. I believe that I accept. So the sales is always negative. The sales is almost always negative. It will be as far as the math problems in this class, they will always be negative. But just, but in the case of income elasticity, maybe it's negative, maybe it's positive. So in this case, is this elastic or inelastic? It's inelastic. Because ignoring any negative sign that might be there, 0.5, that's less than one, right? So it's inelastic. So what happened here? Going from 30,000 a year to 36,000 a year. Is that huge? Yeah. Yeah, for the people that are living there, that's big. And what ended up resulting? We sold five more cars. So big increases in incomes did lead to an increase in sales, but not a very big increase. The people make 20% more money, but we only did 10% more sales. So apparently there's other things that people are spending their extra money on instead of saying, woo, let's go to the car lot. Okay, but a few of them said, yeah, let's go to car lot, but a bunch of others said, let's go to the meth lot or whatever they're going to say. Now, the other thing, we to blindly do the math. Click percentage change in sales, you get this number. Oops. Then you do the percentage change in income, get this number divided to get your elasticity. Ask yourself, is it elastic or inelastic? Now it's time to shift up. Exact same thing you did with the price elasticity. But now is when you got to turn on the brain because there's one other thing we have to evaluate. The fact is this a positive number or a negative number means something here. Because I'm kind of into that. Don't go with math. I said math, not math. Math. Cool, we need math. If your elasticity number is positive, like the one that we had, the income elasticity is a positive number that is normal. You get more money, you buy more of the product. 
but a normal product is also, for the fun of it, going to have a negative price elasticity. If they raise the price, what are we going to do? Buy less of it, right? That's normal behavior. For a normal product, a normal thing like Sun Drop, Chainsaw, Big Macs, they're going to have a positive income elasticity. We give more money, we buy more of it, but they're also going to have a negative price elasticity. If they raise the price, we're going to slow down buying them. Okay. But what happens if you have an income elasticity that is negative? When people get more money, they're going to buy less of your product. What are things that you are going to say, give me more money, I'm going to buy less of this crap? I did give you a hint there. Yeah. Okay. Inferior, substandard, sub lesser quality, right? You get more money, you're going to stop buying department store toilet paper, and you're going to buy the good stuff. You're going to stop buying the department store detergent, and you're going to buy the good stuff. You can stop buying the Sam's Club soda, and you're going to buy the good stuff. You can stop buying Viena sausages and spam, and you can start actually eating hamburgers, right? So those products that are inferior, well, you're going to stop buying used Kias, and you're going to buy a Honda, a Toyota, a Ford, or whatever, right? An inferior product is one of them that when we get more money, we're going to buy less of it. Are there things in your life that is that way for you right now? Sure. Yeah. How many of you got whatever? You got the whatever janky straight talk iPhone that was four years old and that kind of stuff, or no, even worse, you got some no name Android phone that you only pay forty dollars for and the thing reboots three times a day and it's slower than molasses and you're like, I can't wait to get rid of this thing. Well, what are you doing? Still using it? Why? Because you can't afford anything it's else. It gets the job done, but you're looking forward to the day that, well, when I get my next real job, one of the first things I'm going to do is use this sucker as a paperweight and get the real phone. Is that any of you? Not that you don't want to admit to it at the moment, but, it's, yeah. but that, that's, there are going to be those inferior things in your life, those inferior products. In the grand scheme of things, everything, unless it's at the top of the heap, Everything is inferior product at some point. There are some of y'all that are saying my 73 Ford Pinto is inferior to a Kia. But there's some people saying a Kia is inferior to a Honda. You give me more money, I buy the Honda instead of the Kia. But there's some people say you give me more money, that Honda is inferior to the Lexus. A Lexus. And there's some people that the money's enough, the Lexus isn't good enough for them, the Lexus is inferior to. A Mercedes. Comparable. Uh, some people will say, well, the Mercedes is inferior compared to, I don't know, the Rolls Royce, the Lamborghini, the Porsche. And there's some people that can say, well, the Lamborghini is inferior to the Gulfstream 5 jet, right? Because I'm flying everywhere I'm going. Once you get to the top of the pile, otherwise, at some stage in this life, it can be inferior. It just depends on who you are and where your income is. Right now, y'all are broke. Y'all will be fine if somebody set y'all up with a mirror Honda, right? For some of y'all, y'all be like, woohoo, Honda, score! Went forward, well, forward focus or something, score! Some of y'all will be happy with one of those. Some of y'all will be happy with those. Now, but hopefully years from now, y'all will like not be settling for something that bad. That's what you are having to settle for now. I'm not going to say the same thing for your various boyfriends, girlfriends, whatever. This is just hopefully your time. Anyway. Um, spam. If I eat a sausage, it's inferior to a, ham to a hot dog. A hot dog is inferior to a hamburger. A hamburger is inferior to a sirloin. Sirloin is inferior to... Uh, New York Strip. New York Strip is inferior to Porterhouse. I can't eat the foods with all. Very much so. <laughs> but Chinese don't think so. <laughs> well, they have to look at flavor, so anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. oh, no, I just thought it would be more. As long as they keep cooking it in the same sauce, I'm still going to eat it. 
I can offend everybody in class, but I remember you trying to class school, so I'm just leaving it at that and moving on. Oh, anyway, um, so how, depending on our income levels, you know, some things are inferior, some things are going to be seen as normal. What's normal to us might be inferior to some people. What's normal to us might be a luxury item to somebody else. Like the 73 Ford Pinto is a luxury item to the homeless guy that's living underneath the bridge, right? Yeah. So it just really depends on who you are, where you are. And so generally when you're looking at the income elasticity of the product, you have to be looking specifically at who are my customers and what exactly is their income for the typical normal customer that's buying our products and how does their changes in their income impact things. You can't be looking at the outer edge cases of the billionaires and the people under the bridge, but you gotta be looking at who's buying it. How many people are gonna come from New York City driving down to Dundas to buy a used car? Nobody. So the, used, the Dundas used car lot is gonna be looking at what? What are the incomes of people in our area? And how does their price change, their income change, impact our sale, car sales? And they're gonna be like, well, we're not selling many of the nice new cars, so we need to get rid of those, start bringing us the five or 10 year old cars that are like cheap. Instead of trying to sell $15,000 cars, we need to be selling $5,000 cars, right? That's kind of, because that's more in the price range of the customer base that we're answering to. So you kind of have to look at that. So, um, a luxury good is gonna have an income elasticity, again, is very high. Very, 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 very high. How much, how many of you like to have a Gulfstream 5 jet plane? Good chunk of you. How high is your income going to have to go before you go from owning zero airplanes to one airplane? At least 15 million years. It's got to go up a huge honking amount, right? So it is, has a positive income elasticity, but it's going to be very, very, very high because it's going to take a humongous change in your income. Very, 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 yeah. It's going to take a humongous change in your income before you get to any kind of movement in sales. Right. So. Y'all happy and comfortable with that? Okay. I'm going to be kind of, I don't know, if we're, if I'm going to use the word aggressive, optimistic, but we're going to finish this chapter today. So, the third one is cross price elasticity. This is going to be how does the price of another product impact the sales of our product? Price elasticity. If SunTrop changes the price of SunTrop, how much does SunTrop sales change? Cross price elasticity is how much does Sun Drop sales change if Mountain Dew lowers their price, if Coca Cola lowers their price, if Budweiser lowers their price. Hmm? Yeah, it's not very often that you're drinking a Budweiser and a Sun Drop at the same time, so they kind of do compete against each other. You know, some people are going to come home in the afternoon and say, well, you know, it was, just, it was a good day and I'm going to drink a sun drop. Some people are going to come home today and say, it was a bad day and I'm going to drink some beer to forget about it. And then well, they both are yellow and sun drop has more flavor than Budweiser's. So, okay. Okay. So, how does the change in price of one product impact the change in the price of another? And ultimately, what we're going to be looking at is, it depends again. You can end up with a positive elast cross price elasticity or negative, depending on is a product a substitute or is it a complement. If Mountain Dew gets cheaper, what are we going to do? We drink more Mountain Dew, and if we're drinking more Mountain Dew, we're going to drink less Sun Drop. Right? Well, so you'd have a negative there. The price of one goes down, the price of the sales of what? Well, a positive. The price of Sun Drop, um, English, the price of Mountain Dew gets lower, the sales of Sun Drop is going to get lower. So you actually have a positive relationship there, mathematically. 
but you can't have if they're compliments, like peanut butter and jelly. If the price of peanut butter goes up, we're going to buy less peanut butter, right? But if the price of peanut butter goes up, we're going to buy less jelly too, right? So sometimes you may end up with a negative cross price. Sometimes you may end up with a positive cross price. It depends on are these products substitutes for one another or complements for one another. So here again, you blindly do the math. You compute the elasticity. You answer the is it elastic or not. And then you're going to come back and look at the positive and negative sign to determine is this sucker, are these things substitutes or complements. So it's percentage change in sales of one product compared to the percentage change in price of another product. So here again, blindly, you're going to get some sales figures, do that percentage change in price for the, I mean, percentage change in sales, do it, and then do the percentage change in whatever the other thing is, and do the math. Don't think, just do. So, I think y'all know whether these are substitutes or complements, but let's just, for the fun of it, let's see, last year Coke sold... 80 million. This year, Coke sold 96 million. Last year, Pepsi was selling for a dollar bottle. This year, Pepsi is it? went up to a dollar and a half. We'll go with that. So, right. so what happened? Pepsi. Increase your price. So people bought less Pepsi. But they still had to have brown soda, so what did they do? They bought more Coke. Right? Does that make sense to you? Because those products are substitutes. Yes. So percentage change in Coke. Coke is now what was it? They're now doing 96 where they used to do 80. They're selling 16 million more. Compared to the 80, that's what, 20%? Oh, I just did a second equal sign there, sorry. So Coke is selling 20% more soda. Why? They didn't change their price. The incomes of their customers didn't change. The only thing that we're certainly changed is the fact that Pepsi is now selling for a buck and a half compared to the dollar. Pepsi raised their price by 50 cents, which was a 50% increase. So Pepsi raised their price by 50%. Positive number. Coke sales went up by 20%. Positive number. So when you do 0 0.2 divided by 0.5, you end up with 0.4. A positive number. Is this elastic or inelastic? Inelastic. And then the hint. It's because it's a positive, these are substitutes. So there's one other little thing to hold on to. Based on how inelastic this is, the smaller that number is, the less closely related these products are. The way the math worked out, Coke and Pepsi, they are substitutes for one another, but they ain't very closely related. There's not many people that are saying, well, I'm purposely going to drink less, pep less Pepsi, more Coke. There's this, but some people are making that choice. Some people are going to say, well, Pepsi's more expensive. I'm going to drink less Pepsi, and I'm going to buy Spark Plus for cheap. I'm going to drink less Pepsi, and I'm going to drink more Budweiser. I'm going to drink less Pepsi, and I'm going to renew my Netflix account. All right. The higher this number is, the more elastic this ends up getting, that's a sign of just how closely related the products are to one another. The math in this example is showing Coke and Pepsi not very closely related. But spark plugs and Pepsi. If Pepsi raises lowers their price, people I mean Pepsi raises their price, people are gonna buy less Pepsi. So what are they going to do with that extra money? Well, some of them are going to buy Coke. Some of them are going to take that money and buy Mountain Dew. Some of them are going to say, well, I'm going to give up on soda, and I'm going to spend that money on something else, and maybe somewhere along the line, somebody's going to end up buying it, using some of that money to buy spark plugs. Flip side of it is, okay, 
you're driving down the road and your car breaks down and you got to go get a tune up and you go to the auto parts store and it's like you only got twenty dollars in your pocket and you got to spend that to get eight pack of spark plugs and you walk out the store rehearsing so your wallet is empty so what are you not going to buy this week because you no longer have a twenty dollar bill in there because you just bought yeah. Bunch of spark plugs. Yeah. Some of you can buy a little bit less gas, but still got to go to work. Some of you can buy less yeah. Pepsi. Pepsi and spark plugs are competing with one another, competing for the limited amount of money that we have in our wallets. So the, everything is a very, very, very small relationship. There's very few people that say, well, spark plugs went up. I'm buying less Pepsi, y'all. Ain't many people that think that way. But our behavior bears it up. Somewhere in America, people are buying spark plugs, and as a result, somewhere in America, somebody's buying less Pepsi. Somebody in America's buying less Coke. Somebody in America's buying less meth. Right. There, these relationships, it's going to be a teeny tiny little cross price less secret is going to be there. Because in the grand scheme of things, even compliments also are a little bit substitutes too, where they're competing for our money. If peanut butter and jelly goes up, well, a peanut butter goes more expensive. Well, we're going to buy less peanut butter. And so if we're buying less peanut butter, we're going to buy less jelly. Well, but which do you like better, peanut butter or jelly? So if you got to still you can buy you one. You can't really eat a jelly sandwich. You can eat a peanut butter. Yeah. So what may end up happening? Well, peanut butter may get expensive enough. I'm still going to buy the peanut butter. I'm giving up on the jelly, right? Even though they're the compliments, might end up getting that substitutional, yeah, we'll cover that substitutional behavior anyway. With me. Okay, well, we didn't quite fit. Basically, we did finish the chapter, but we didn't. When we come back, we'll tie this up, put a bow on it, do another math problem. You already know everything you need to know in order to do the module two homework. If it is not available yet, it will be available in the next minute. So you'll have two bits of homework available to you. Now, only first three, and then one other later. Any questions? Any other questions? No, sir. Okay, get out. We're going to get some patrons this weekend. What'd you just say? We're going to get some patrons this weekend.